So here we are, episode 6, the grand finale of Primeval Series 1. But let me start off by thanking all of my lovely subscribers, of which there are now 218. Whether you came for Prehistoric Park, Zoo Tycoon or Primeval, I appreciate your support, and I hope to continue to create content for you in the years to come. Much like episode 5, this one starts off with a round of golf, only this time it's cut using a leg bone of what I presume to be some Ice Age mammal. Claudia arrives to talk to Nick about Helen, but also to set up the concept of some of the later series. If we're going to defend ourselves more effectively, then we've got to do something more than just react. We've got to discover why these anomalies are opening and then predict when the next one will appear. Well, you know, maybe possible to do that. I need more time. Fine. How does Monday morning sound? How does Series 2 sound? Meanwhile, in the Forest of Dean, the anomaly has reopened and a large animal has escaped. No trail, no footprints, nothing. How is that even possible? I get this thing climbs trees, but how did it not make any marks on the ground? Must have gone back. Oh, excellent assessment there, Captain Soldier Man. 10 out of 10 soldiering there. Meanwhile, in Wellington Zoo... Wait a minute, Wellington Zoo's in New Zealand! What's that got to do with anything? Maybe Captain Soldier Man was right, because I can't see any other way for the Predator to travel all the way to the other side of the world. Anyway, the Predator breaks into the lion enclosure and steals a lion. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, Abby is trying to teach Connor how to chat up a woman at a bar. Who do you think would win? In a fight? between Wolverine and Spider-Man. I said flirty, not nerdy. That's entry-level comic book, Abby. It's lie. It's fun. Yeah, to be honest, Abby, who in this day and age doesn't know who Wolverine and Spider-Man are? And for the record, it's a no-brainer. Wolverine's indestructible. But girls don't talk comic books. Um, actually, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Something's up. I've got to go. Better book your flights to New Zealand, then. We then see Ben Miller being impatient. Why? Well, he just always is. That's kind of how he's written. But on the subject of Spider-Man, it turns out Stephen's spidey sense is tingling. Of course, it turns out he's actually being stalked by Helen. Do you, do you want? Cold beer would be nice. Abby and Connor See, arrive in New Zealand and discover that one of the lions is missing. Connor comes up with some pretty useless explanations for its disappearance. You put it down somewhere. Forgot where you left it. it happens all the time. Maybe you just ran away to join the circus. Oh, whatever. He does, however, spot a conveniently placed leaf with a drop of blood on it. Why don't you just tell me what you want? Cold beer would be nice. Okay, she actually wants a meeting with Nick and Ben to talk about the escaped creature. And it looks like these two may have had an affair eight years ago. Meanwhile, at the home office, Claudia's spider sense is tingling. But it was all a dream. Concurrently, Abby's in New Zealand feeding the elephants. This confuses the heck out of the future predator because he can't pinpoint a target. Oh, the T Rex is heading for the elephants. Okay, I'll try to get there first. I need to lure her. Matilda decides to go for a smaller. But easy. The next morning, Abby and Connor discuss such things as the blood belonging to a bat and the fact that Abby's boss has gone missing. So Helen meets up with Nick, Stephen, Claudia and Ben and tells them the animal has come from the future. At the same time, Abby goes off to work at the sea lion enclosure with the predator following on behind. I want you to remember that this scene occurs now. Back at the bridge, Helen gives a vague description of the predator. Like a great ape, but bigger, faster. A lot more agile. It has human levels of intelligence and an almost supernatural ability to stalk its prey. The only possible explanation is that it strayed through a future anomaly into the Permian era and then on into ours. She then moves back into their house and explains to Nick that the creature followed her through the Permian anomaly. Later on, Connor brings Stephen up to speed with all of his discoveries. It's just I found some bat blood at the zoo yesterday. I mean, you know, it's, it's probably nothing, but one of the lions went missing yesterday and now Abby's boss, he's just disappeared as well. How could you think any of that information was nothing? Stephen makes it to New Zealand in record timing to make sure Abby doesn't get eaten by the future predator. And where is future predator? There he is! Let's have a good old look at that ugly mug. Now I can't review this animal like I would a prehistoric animal because of course it doesn't exist. But as a piece of speculative evolution I think this thing's a bit too gnarly, shrink wrapped and hairless. I think the denizens of Dougal Dixon's Batavia are still the best future bats. So the predator escapes and the next day Helen tells Claudia that they need dogs if they're going to track the creature down in its lair. What happens when we find this thing? We kill it. 
you to kill. That makes her a freshly changed. I was beginning to feel like a social worker. Uh, have you forgotten the time you shot that Arthur plural with a machine gun? The dogs follow the scent of the creature, but it ambushes them. It pounces around from a few of the trees and then gets bored and bumps off. The team then discusses what they need to do to defeat the creature. They realise it must be using echolocation to track them down, and that the creature is indeed a bat from the future. Three quarters of all mammal species are bats or rats. Maybe the future belongs to them. That's interesting in all, Helen, but why are you eating an apple with a knife? Connor runs off to get an oscilloscope without any defence. Of course, when he gets to the car, he's ambushed by the future predator. I have to say, this scene is very effective and suspenseful. From using the oscilloscope to track the creature coming ever closer, much like the water glasses in Jurassic Park, to the incredible tracking shot through the window of the car. Somehow, Abby manages to hear him being attacked from the Komodo dragon enclosure, then turn up on the scene about five seconds later. Hmm, seems like time for another painful nerd reference, say, screenwriters. Maybe you should go home. No, I'm gonna stay. I mean, Han Solo, he wouldn't give up before a job's done, would he? I always saw him more as R2-D2 myself, but I, I take your point. Well, they finally acknowledge that people other than nerds have seen Star Wars. So the doggos track down the creature's lair, and they discover that the creature's given birth to five offspring. The predator then turns up and starts attacking people, so Cutter grabs one of the babies and runs into the greenhouse. He then shoots out the glass above it to distract the creature, but I must say this effect doesn't work very effectively. It's pretty clear that the glass, the creature in the background, will be completely disconnected. So the creature is killed and the offspring are caught and placed in a box. Helen explains to Ben Miller that they need to use the baby predators to track down the future anomaly in the Permian. We kill them. To let even one of them loose in the Permian era could be a potential catastrophe. The cause of a mass extinction, perhaps? Claudia then discovers that she is in actual fact an anomaly. The next morning, they get ready to go through the Permian anomaly to find the future anomaly. Now, I've already made this point before with the dodos, but let's make it again. Count the number of soldiers that go through the anomaly. Five, right? Remember that. Don't go. Stay. I think this is a mistake. I've got a really bad feeling about this. I have this terrible feeling the timeline might be rewritten and I might come back as a more annoying character. Do you think you should, uh, advance that romance subplot a bit further? Oh, yes, good idea. Oh, they're kissing again. Didn't they do enough of that last episode? Only three soldiers? What happened to the other two? Meanwhile, in 2007... The creature's autopsy proves beyond any doubt that it was... Definitely a male. It's got to be female. It was nurturing its young. Maybe in this species that's a job for the boys? <sighs> Better be. Because if not, music mother's still out there. Oh right, so no one was watching the anomaly that whole time. As the soldiers set up a camp, Nick takes some pictures of Helen using a camera. However, when he takes the picture, he realises this is the same picture that was developed in the first episode from a camera found at the wrecked camp. In his horror, Nick realises that they've created their own past and that this mission is doomed to fail. Helen, on the other hand, is more concerned with the fact that they might be near the future anomaly. That's all you cared about. You just wanted to find the future for yourself. Helen's obsession with finding the future does at least pay off in later series. Unlike some other things, as we will find out. The Predator then ambushes them and of course takes the black guy first. We then see it take out another guy, but we don't see what happened to the other two. Presumably they went the way of the dodo, quite literally in this case. Captain Soldier Man then tries to kill it, but unfortunately this thing seems to be about as tough as a dog, so of course it kills him instead. Now Cutter's at the mercy of the Predator. What reformed villain can save him now? Yeah. You will die. No. No. Captain Soldier Man comes to the realisation that the body they found in the first episode was his. He then dies and Cusser sets about burying him and the other men. On the bright side, at least the Gorgonopsid ate all of the baby predators. Or did he? 
Not that it matters anyway, we never get any follow-up to what happened to the baby predators in the later episodes. Nick and Helen return back through the anomaly and Nick breaks the bad news to the team. Helen then says that she's going to go straight back through the anomaly and she only came back to pick up Stephen, thus exposing their affair and ruining everything. An extremely awkward moment. Stephen responds to her proposition in not too uncertain terms. Sometimes you can be a real bitch. But it ain't over yet, kids. Where's Claudia? Claudia? Where's Claudia Brown? I don't know anyone of that name. What? Look, where is she? Oh, oh this was a year before her. the Dark Knight, wasn't it? This isn't right. Something's going wrong. Something, something's happened. Something's changed. We've done something. We've... Something that we've done has changed the past, and she's not here anymore. Oh my god. So that was episode 6 and series 1. Was it good? I think it was. I think as a TV series it was very good Saturday Night Entertainment. And yes, the animals were incredibly inaccurate, but I think it was still an enjoyable show. I hold series 1 to the high esteem of being the best primeval series. And I do think it's a shame that a lot of the things it sets up never got any payoff. What happened to the baby predators in the Permian? What happened to Claudia Brown? What did they screw up in the past to cause all of the changes? I'd really like some answers to these things, but these aren't issues with Series 1, they're more issues with the later seasons. So if you're here for them, see you next year.